um, that that occur. Um, and, you know, Sarah mentioned yesterday the hippocampus, like, oh, my God, the hippocampus, I don't know anything about it. And Laura is here to tell you, um, it's not all the hippocampus, a lot of her work concerns uh, the cerebellum. And I think that knowing the neural substrates is worth it. This is what I want to say to this group, because I think it has implications far beyond just being able to name parts of the brain. In thinking about the neural architecture of how the brain really does it, we can draw implications for behavior, for design, and more. So to just introduce uh, Laura Rondi Rig, um, she's very much a product of France. Her PhD um, uh, is uh, 1997 in neuroscience in Paris. And uh, then she spent a postdoc at MIT. Uh, but following that experience in the US went back to Paris and, and moved through the sort of ladders of uh, the French academic system so that now she's a leader of a group within the CNRS in a building um, at the Sorbonne. Um, her, her address is a forbidding um, building B uh, <laughs> etage sank. Um, uh, I, I once visited, it's fairly much of a challenge to find it. Um, but it's a really inspirational lab where she does both behavioral and neural work with um, rodents and with humans, including children, including the aging. Um, so welcome, Laura. Thanks so much for being with us. And please put questions in the chat as they occur to you. Yeah. Thank you, Nora, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you uh, for the organizer. Uh, for this great meeting. I have to say it's a pleasure to uh, share my work with you today and it's true that it will be more neuroscience influence. <laughs> so I hope we can discuss at the end of the talk and try to make link between uh, the different cultures. Uh, so I'll try to share my screen. Let's see. Um, okay. Should be okay, no? Um, okay. So, um, um, so be before entering uh, in the neural network themselves, uh, let me first introduce the framework uh, in which uh, we actually um, perform uh, this work. So. Uh, our main focus of interest uh, is actually uh, the link, let me see, the link between uh, sensory processing, uh, sensory information and behavior. What we try to understand, I, I think we all try to understand uh, this, is to how the brain can actually process sensory information in order to uh, perform behavior adapted to a particular context. What the main uh, or the most important things here is the fact that sensory information not only comes from the environment itself, producing uh, or, or um, giving information like visual information or um, auditory or even olfactory information, but sensory information also come from the behavior itself that actually produces constantly changing self-motion information. And this self-motion information um, impact both sensory processing as well as learning mechanism. And this type of uh, learning called reinforcement learning is essential to adapt uh, it, our behavior to a particular context or to memorize a behavior. So um, we tackle this question in the framework of uh, navigation and um, trying to address a complex but exciting issue. How can the brain generate, stabilize or update our coding of space, meaning the coding of place or direction, for example? So um, 
in, in, uh, in rodents, neuronal proxy of place and direction have been discovered um, in the early or uh, in the middle of the 90s. In 1971, John O'Keefe and Dostrovsky discovered place cells in the hippocampus of rodents and uh, proposed that these assemblies of place cells form a brain cognitive map and could be a support for the memory of space. A little bit later, in 1984, James, uh, Jim Rank um, discovered head direction cell in the subiculum, a uh, presubiculum, and these uh, cells discharge in relation to the animal's directional heading, independent of the animal location and behavior. Um, the fact of the ability to maintain a sense of direction and location while moving in one's environment is actually fundamental for our daily life and also fundamental to find our way out and to navigate. So um, we are particularly interested in this self-motion perception problem, which requires to integrate um, a combination of multiple self-motion signal coming from optic flow, but also vestibular signal, as well as somatosensory and proprioceptive cues, how, and how these are integrated with the environmental information uh, during either exploration, free exploration of a familiar environment, for example, or during goal-directed behavior. So to address this question, we use um, both mice, um, transgenic mice, with alteration of uh, plasticity at the level of the cerebellum, and we record play cell or head direction cell while the mice are exploring um, familiar uh, arena, for example. But we also use human uh, behavior um, that we combine with imaging studies. So, um, what about the cerebellum? So the cerebellum is uh, um, somehow the ugly duckling of the brain. Uh, even if it contains more than 50% of the neuron, it has long been considered as a motor structure by behavioral neuroscientists. Um, no cognition here. Um, a reference by electrophysiologists uh, because they implanted actually the reference when they were recorded the hippocampus, for example, the reference was uh, the cerebellum, or ignored by most of the brain imaging studies during a long time because the sequence uh, of acquisition of image were actually stopped um, before the cerebellum. So uh, despite that, um, the idea that the cerebellum could play a role in spatial cognition is a concept that emerged in the early 90s, uh, in particular with the work of uh, Jamie Schmaman, and took around 25 years to reach a consensus that cerebellum is playing a role in cognitive function. Uh, mainly two um, studies um, participated, um, or <laughs> a lot of studies participated, but these two studies are maybe uh, the, the most um, um, uh, to be highlighted to show that the cerebellum is actually playing a role beyond the motor domains. A first work uh, was done in the monkey macaque. Uh, it's an anatomical study showing that indeed uh, that it exists anatomical topography in the cerebellum and particular uh, lobule of the cerebellum, in particular this cruise one that I'm going to talk um, quite a lot during this talk, is actually anatomically connected uh, with the prefrontal cortex uh, in macaque. Uh, this work from uh, Studley and uh, Schmaman lab showed that it also exists a functional topography in the cerebellum, showing that different parts of the cerebellum plays different role, and in particular, some parts of the cerebellum are involved in spatial processing. So in, in, uh, in animals, uh, we faced uh, the same type um, of problem, and my team actually contributed to go beyond uh, the cerebellum motor dogma, demonstrating that the cerebellum is actually a pl uh, playing a role during navigation. So in uh, 2005, I actually um, 
gave, a, I think, um, an international talk, my first one maybe, um, and wrote this review, is the Cybellum ready for navigation? Uh, asking not only uh, is the Cybellum part of the navigation network, but also is the community ready to hear that the Cybellum is actually playing a role in navigation. And at that time, uh, community was not quite ready, <laughs> I have to say. Um, and then, uh, indeed, um, we could demonstrate that um, Cybellum participate to spatial navigation independently of any motor deficit. And more recently, we showed that Cybellum even shade hippocampal spatial code. And I will come back um, to this um, a little bit later. Um, so the hippocampus uh, Noah was talking about. So the hippocampus uh, is a structure known to be a center for spatial memory. Uh, the discovery of this hippocampal play cell by uh, John O'Keefe and Dostrovsky in 1971, uh, followed by a behavioral uh, experiment by um, Richard Morris, for example, showing that uh, the, um, an, in, um, an inactivation of the uh, hippocampus altered uh, navigation or uh, spatial learning in a water maze, um, was the basis uh, for the idea that the, the hippocampus is a center for spatial memory. So um, when we began this, uh, this story of the cerebellum uh, that could influence uh, hippocampus uh, activity, we looked at um, the anatomy. And uh, we could actually found, found in the literature that the cerebellum is anatomically connected to the space coding network. Uh, at least through two main um, pathways. And we'll see later that there are even more pathways that connect the cerebellum to the hippocampus. So uh, at least two pathways, one uh, through uh, the parietal cortex, so first uh, centrolateral and ventrolateral thalamus and the parietal cortex, and the second pathway through the HD system when we can find this head direction cell I uh, introduced at the beginning of my talk. So uh, because these two pathways converge through this entorenal cortex through the hippocampus, we actually decided to record play cell in the hippocampus in mice having um, an alteration of the cerebellum during a free exploration of, a, of an arena. Um, so our working hypothesis is that the cerebellum act as an adaptive filter producing a novelty signal. The idea here is that the cerebellum is able to implement internal model um, based on self-motion information to predict the sensory consequences of action. And the output produced seen by the cerebellum uh, which is actually uh, the prediction minus this actual sensory state coming from the self-motion itself, could provide a novelty signal important for the space coding system that could stabilize our spatial representation of space during movement, meaning during navigation. So what we did is that uh, we used two types of mice, um, the name <laughs> are not important here, but L7 PKCY or L7 PP2B. Um, it essentially means that they have a deficit of plasticity uh, at, uh, the, in the cellular cortex at the main synapse of uh, the purkinje cell, which is the central uh, cell of uh, the cellular. And um, importantly, we first checked that these two mice model which have a specific alteration of the cerebellum we know with no alteration of the uh, hippocampus, um, have no motor deficits. In that case, we check this with a multiple type of um, motor, a battery of motor test, balance, uh, hanging, but also rotor rod, and show that there is no motor deficit here um, that can eventually um, influence the, the cognition that we tested uh, later on. 
So how did we uh, perform the um, the um, the, uh, how did we investigate play cell activity in this 3D uh, behaving mice? So we used uh, a circular arena like this, um, in which there is an object that mice can use in order to explore this uh, arena that becomes familiar. So here, there is two types of um, uh, experiment, one in the light, in the presence of object, and one in the dark, in which uh, mice have to rely on self-motion information in order to, uh, to explore this arena. So to make too long story short, what we observe in these two types of mice is the following. First, we show that an alteration of, uh, in that case, it's a long-term depression plasticity uh, impaired uh, the stability of play cell uh, only in the dark, which was the case here. Whereas uh, in PP2B mice, they had actually an instability of this play cell only in the light. So it um, shows that different computation in the cerebellum affect or impact the stability of play cell in different sensory conditions. So following uh, this result, uh, we uh, actually realize that the cerebellum, um, when it, it is impaired, is also able to impair the memory of space. However, as you all know, uh, navigation is not only a memory of space. It's also the ability to find a goal in a particular um, environment and to find uh, the way from the departure point to this goal. So we, uh, and this was also uh, the idea put uh, forward by Howard uh, Eichenbaum and colleague, that the hippocampus is not only a center for memory of space, but also a center for episodic memory with this idea that the memory of the what, where, and when um, is, um, is actually also um, hippocampus uh, centered. And the discovery of hippocampus time cell um, put uh, forward or strengthens this hypothesis. Um, so here is a theory that Eichenbaum and Cohen put in one of their um, review in 2014, proposing that um, the navigation or sequence navigation has actually the same spatial temporal template than episodic memory. Uh, indeed, if you look at um, um, a memory or different episode of memory, you can describe it as multiple events, uh, items in context, organized in episodes, temporally organized in episodes. For example, um, for this particular episode one, um, you can, for example, remember that you woke up this morning, uh, one, and then two, you had breakfast, and finally you were looking forward as the second day of this conference and something like that. And this is clearly temporally organized. What they proposed, is that, um, oh, sorry, uh, is that actually um, sequence uh, navigation is organized with the exact same spatial temporal uh, template with places, um, oops, <laughs> sorry, uh, with places uh, that can be encountered along the route uh, and organize also temporally, meaning that when you uh, navigate uh, along one particular route, the different places you encounter will be organized so um, temporally because you will first um, encounter uh, the place one and then the place two, uh, etc. 
So uh, because I worked uh, when I was um, uh, in Boston, I worked at MIT, but I also worked with Howard Eichenbaum at Boston University and was clearly influenced by this theory. Um, I therefore um, imagine a task, the Starmes task, in order to evaluate um, at the same time the spatial and sequence memory in a particular navigation task. So I first invented it uh, in mice, and then I adapted it um, using virtual reality for a human study. So let me first show you um, a result that we obtained with Francesco Battaglia. Uh, a friend and colleague, um, in which we, we recorded uh, hippocampal so-called play cells in this um, uh, star maze task. And what we observed, so in, here uh, in color, you have the activity of one particular play cell, and when it is um, uh, orange or yellow here, it means it is where uh, the play cell or the hippocampal cell is uh, actually activated. And we compared three types of um, trials, the training trial, the place-based trial in which we change the departure points and mice have to go back to the same location than during the training, and a sequence-based uh, strategy in which mice have to reproduce the same sequence than during the training. But you can see here that the, that the arrival was totally different compared to the training. What we observe is that hippocampal cells were perfectly able, for example, to be activated at a particular location. If animals change uh, their uh, path, you can see the same activation at the exact same place, so, which is traditional, traditional play cell. But what we also observe is that in case mice have to reproduce the sequence, so the path from the departure point to the goal, uh, this cell, for example, was also able to uh, be activated um, following the distance from the goal or the sequence rather than the location. And you have a second example here. Here you can see that this is the same location, not the same path. And here you can see that this is this to the blue and the orange are the same paths, and that in that case, the cell is activating depending on the distance from the departure point and not depending on the location it would have been here in that case. So following this, we um, actually uh, tested uh, uh, the activity, so we wanted to test um, the activity of the brain uh, during the learning of this task in human, um, and to look uh, at the global network rather than uh, only at the hippocampus activity. So to do so, we uh, propose uh, or we uh, propose to volunteers to uh, try or to learn this star maze task while they were um, actually in a scanner. So they were able to see the screen um, being in the scanner and they had a keypad in order to navigate in this um, uh, virtual environment. So let me show you. Uh, this, this was the first one we did. We have now new um, environment. So at each intersection, the subject need to decide to turn right or left. You see that there is a, a virtual, there, there is a, a environmental cues all around. And then ca they can also remember uh, the sequence of movement at each intersection. So in that case, left, right, um, no, right, left, and right. And in case uh, they reach the proper location and use a proper sequence, they um, receive uh, this uh, virtual gift. So the okay. Voilà. So what um, uh, what we wanted to know is what how, what were uh, the different uh, brain regions activating activated during 
this, uh, the learning of this uh, navigation uh, paradigm. So what uh, we compared for uh, the different, um, um, for this different trial I will show you is the activation of the different brain region in this first alley that was the same uh, in each uh, different uh, trial. And what we observe first is that during uh, this, uh, the learning of this trial, we uh, had um, an activation of the hippocampus bilaterally uh, together with the medial parietal cortex, the medial prefrontal, um, the striatum, do, uh, dorsal striatum, the caudate nucleus. So these three were not so surprising, but also the uh, bil bilateral uh, activation of the cebellum and more particularly activation of this uh, lobule seven across one that correspond to the region um, that has been described by Strick to be connected to the prefrontal cortex in the monkey. Um, so um, if, if you try to um, memorize this network, you will see that uh, in the following slide, half of this network will serve different strategies. So um, indeed what uh, we actually did in this task is that once people have learned the task, what we can do is that we change the departure point. We don't tell people that we change the departure point and they can spontaneously use either uh, the memory of the sequence of turns, the right, left, right turn in order to go back to uh, this location, or um, they can also remember where was actually uh, the, um, the location uh, with the learning departure point. So learning departure point was here in one, and this was actually the arrival. And what we actually um, saw is that, uh, so it's true in mice and also in human, and it's equivalent in a woman and males, um, both use place-based and sequence-based strategies. So the blue as well as um, the green. Um, and in humans, there was a preference uh, for the sequence-based strategy. Interestingly, and we can discuss that later, we can modify this a ratio, uh, place-based versus sequence-based, if when we change the departure point, the view uh, the, the, the people see is very different from the view they have seen uh, before during the training. So we did that and we could separate uh, people um, depending on the strategies they were uh, using spontaneously. And so we looked uh, at uh, the activation of the brain at that time. And if you uh, remember the uh, network I showed you during training, you can see here that in the place-based strategy, we observed um, half of this network activated here with the left cerebellum, again, cruise one activated, the right hippocampus and the medial parietal cortex. And for the sequence-based strategy, it was actually the complementary network uh, also showed during training. And again, always during this first study. So meaning before the behavior itself, um, this time was the right cerebellum cruise one the left hippocampus and the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, we perform functional, um, uh, functional anatomy analysis and to show or to uh, investigate if there were particular correlation or uh, activation, correlated activity between structures that uh, could uh, correspond to either the place-based or the sequence-based strategy. And what we observe here, so you have the ALO score here, for example, and the EGO score in green. What we observed is that the, the ability to be successful in the place-based strategy is actually highly correlated uh, with um, high correlation between the, acti of the activity of the medial parietal cortex with the left cerebellum. And hippocampus is activated, but is not correlated with the activity of the cerebellum. In sequence-based uh, responses, we observed that 
a high correlation between the activity of the left hippocampus and of the right cerebellum. Uh, there was also high correlation with the prefrontal cortex, again, known to be anatomically connected with the cerebellum cus one and also with the hippocampus. Interestingly, when uh, we compare uh, with uh, the activity uh, we can um, see during uh, the motor behavior uh, itself and not during uh, the, the different trials, the cogn cognitive trial, we could, re we could really um, um, demonstrate that there are two separate networks, one uh, cognitive network and one motor network. So the cognitive network I just described you, in, involving hippocampus, cerebellum cruz one, parietal and prefrontal cortex. And this motor loop involving primary motor cortex and other region of the cerebellum, in particular this level six, eight, nine and 10, nine and 10 being more um, vestibular um, um, uh, structure uh, in, in the cerebellum. Um, fitting also the functional topography that has been uh, desc described by Studle and Schmaman. Um, so, uh, because we, in my lab, we actually um, are trying to perform experiment both in human and in rodents uh, at the same time in order to be able to compare. Um, we were intriguing by the result of this sequence-based strategy. So we wanted to understand even more in details um, how the learning of this sequence-based strategy um, is actually sustained by what kind of, um, not only what kind of uh, structure in the brain, this sequence-based uh, strategy uh, is sustained, but also is there a reorganization of the brain network during the learning of uh, such a sequence-based strategy. So in that case, we combine navigation behavior in always in the same task, uh, simplified, I, I'll explain, with cellular imaging first studies in mice, because we cannot perform imaging a study in freely <laughs> behaving mice, and computational model. Uh, so here I will show you only uh, the identification of the neural network, neural circuits. So in that case, uh, it's again the star maze, but you can see here that it's a simplified version of it. When mice have to learn uh, only two terms, so left and right, in order to find the goal. In that case, it is in water because mice uh, swim very well and they are well motivated to find the platform and to go on it and in order to find the goal. Um, so what, um, so following, so, so mice were trained uh, during several days. And uh, what we did is we looked at um, structure activated um, during the learning of this sequence at two particular moments. At the beginning, when it was first exploration of this new uh, maze and after, uh, mice have learned the sequence. So, um, and then what we did is that we extract the brain, look at uh, the activity of 34 uh, structure uh, in different brain areas, uh, in cortices, uh, in striatum and uh, dopaminergic nuclei, in the hippocampus, as well as in the cerebellum. Um, so uh, we used, as I mentioned just before, two learning stages, what we call early stage. So first exploration of this new environment and 15 late stage. Once the uh, animals have learned uh, the sequence, um, of, uh, the sequence to reach the goal and 14 swimming control in order to uh, make uh, the comparison. So what, uh, what we observed uh, here is uh, actually um, a complete reorganization of uh, the uh, networks 
comparing exploration versus uh, once the sequence is learned. So if you look, if you don't look at the color, but at the labeled, you can see that the different region of the brain in the cortex, in the hippocampus, in striatum and dopaminergic nuclei, and in the cerebellum, are quite the same between the exploration group and the sequence group. However, um, using uh, this uh, clustering analysis, so it's a mark of clustering algorithm, um, we actually showed that um, there is a high correlation of uh, the activity of structure between cortex and striatum during the exploration. Hippocampus and cerebellum are activated, but doesn't seem to be uh, co-activated with the rest of the brain. However, once mice have learned the sequence, you can see a complete reorganization of this uh, network with the hippocampus and the cerebellum, uh, in particular CA1 and here um, global 4 5, beginning the hub of the system and being connected to the rest of the brain. And what uh, we also observe is high, co um, high uh, correlation of activity between uh, hippocampus region and cerebellum region here. So just to summarize, uh, in sequence-based uh, navigation, the transition from the early stage to the uh, late stage is accompanied by a reorganization of the underlying networks from a restricted to a global network with a prominent role of uh, the hippocampal uh, cerebellum interaction um, in that case. Interestingly, if we compare with what we observe uh, in human, we actually observe the same type of network with a strong co-activation of the hippocampus and the cerebellum, in particular uh, Cruz one that was also activated uh, in mice and the prefrontal cortex. One main difference uh, was actually the lateralization that we observed in human. We checked in mice, but we did not, did not observe such a lateralization um, in, uh, in mice. Um, so following that, we actually um, were intriguing of uh, um, the, the connectivity, the anatomical connection in mice of the cerebellum toward the hippocampus. And so using a ribis virus uh, injected in the hippocampus, it's a retrograde virus, we were able to label the different regions of the cerebellum that connect the hippocampus. And interestingly, what we observe is that it's very confidential. It's only certain part of the cerebellum that connect to the hippocampus. And again, we found lobule six of the cerebellum, cross one again, and uh, this uh, vestibular um, part of the cerebellum that has been observed before. Uh, so the central lobe here in green is um, uh, the one that is a uh, uh, the, the, the highly labeled, and it corresponds to Lobel 6 and Cruz 1. So what, what it means here is that, um, to come back to uh, a more complex view of what I have been uh, showing at the beginning, it means that multiple parts of the cerebellum, um, but not all the parts, um, are actually connected to the navigation circuitry and therefore can explain why cerebellum can actually influence uh, the activity of uh, the hippocampus, as I uh, showed you before. So what we are trying to do uh, now in the lab uh, is to understand this different pathway. So here today, um, I will only focus on one particular pathway, which is the one that goes to the hippocampus through the, through the HD system and um, through uh, the head uh, direction cell system. Um, so to understand this pathway more in details, um, postdoc, uh, fantastic postdoc, uh, Mehdi Falanezad uh, came to the lab and we decided to record together retrosplenial cortex 
and at the thalamus, and more particularly the anterodosal part of the thalamus, in which head direction cell exist. Um, so we used the same mice than before when we recorded play cell, and the same um, type of uh, arena than before, with uh, either light condition or dark condition when mice have to rely on self-motion cues. Uh, we ask um, several uh, questions to understand if the cerebellum can impact this head direction cell activity, the same way that it impacts uh, play cell activity. So we looked at uh, HD cell uh, signal generation, anchoring to external cues, maintaining uh, of the uh, activity by self-motion cues, and also because we recorded in two different structures, we also looked at the ability of mice to maintain a unitary, unitary representation of direction that is necessary when you go somewhere because these HD cells are in different brain regions, it needs to be coordinated. If it's not, and if, if one indicate north and the other indicate uh, west, well, you might uh, finally be lost. So this coordination between the different regions of this um, uh, sense of direction is crucial for navigation. Um, so, uh, don't stop on the complexity of this um, slide. The only important thing here is that what we observe is um, unstable activity in this mine, in this mice, in the dark only, meaning when they had to rely on self-motion cues. It was true in the two regions we recorded, and it was it's only illustrated here. Uh, you see in the control, uh, the direction in man is maintained in the light, in the dark, uh, direction is this um, uh, pink thing, uh, indicating in that case the north, uh, here uh, the west, and you see that here in the dark, it's totally lost. Same thing here, same direction for the control, light and dark, and you see that this sense of direction is lost uh, uh, in the dark, in this uh, cerebellar mutant mice. Um, so, in the other mice, we actually observed uh, no difference in the dark, but this time we observed um, a lower stability uh, in the light. And um, more interestingly, what we found in, in two cases is an, an inability of this HD cell to follow the visual cues, uh, which was actually a uh, um, um, the same thing that what we observed uh, in play cell activity. So to, um, uh, yeah, importantly, we also looked at linear speed and angular head velocity because it's more uh, dependent, depending on the vestibular signal. And these are perfectly intact in these mice. Um, so um, suggesting that actually, when cerebellum is altered, um, the signal, the sense of direction exists. Uh, the ability to locate uh, with uh, what we observe with play cell also exists. However, depending on the computation altered in the cerebellum, uh, what we found is that is, is uh, either a deficit in the ability to uh, encore on external cues or an inability to stabilize uh, the, um, the sense of direction in that case uh, when relying on self-motion cues. And if we compare with uh, what we have observed in uh, um, play cell in the same mice and same condition, we actually found the exact same uh, deficit. Again, a deficit of uh, being able to maintain um, a sense of place and a sense of direction in the dark, in one case, and uh, an ability to anchor uh, during uh, movement uh, on uh, the object uh, in the light uh, in another condition. What um, we are now trying to understand is 
what could be the processing or the computation performed by the cell um, to explain this. So what we have shown for sure, and that this is maybe very important when we try to understand navigation, and in particular, um, in, in, in the fact that during navigation, we are moving um, in a particular environment, is that the cell is involved in self-motion processing. And depending on uh, a different cellular computation may actually modify the weight put on these self-motion cues. So I won't go in detail here, but the idea is that in one particular case, the cell is not able to make the prediction properly anymore because the feedback uh, from uh, the movement uh, is not taken properly into account. Therefore, the noise, the prediction um, produced by the cell to the rest of the brain, and in particular to the navigation system, is noisy. And in the other case, it's uh, more the um, integration of self-motion information with uh, environmental information that seems to be altered, uh, with uh, certainly overconfidence on self-motion signal uh, during um, movement and during navigation. So coming back to the um, first uh, uh, schema, um, the idea is, is, is here is that the self-motion information that is crucial during navigation to be taken into account during navigation in order to know where we are um, and in which direction we go and that need to be updated uh, during navigation is um, not properly taken into account if the cerebellum is altered uh, and will therefore impact um, uh, this uh, coding of space of direction in a particular uh, sensory condition. And this is maybe something we have, uh, we need to have into account um, when, uh, when uh, uh, using particular condition of, of navigation. Um, so, um, just to, to conclude, um, one uh, last slide. So, um, I talked about this unitary representation of direction that is really important in the brain, meaning that the different HD cells need to have a coordination of their direction um, during uh, movement and during navigation. Uh, so what we uh, looked at is, is there any um, correlation or irregular correlation between these two structures during um, our recording? And what we found is that there is only one case if there is irregular correlation between uh, cells in these two structures is uh, during self-motion um, exploration in the dark and in this um, L7 PKCY mice. Interestingly, and maybe look at this example here, um, blue and pink first, you see here that it is clear that, for example, there is two cells from these the two structures, thalamus and retrosplenia, um, show the same direction, but in the dark and in uh, these cerebellar mutant mice, they lose their coordination. Uh, and this is a temporal coordination that is important. And a, another example here, when these two cells will fire depending on uh, which direction um, you, the, the mice is facing. Uh, so uh, these two are showing two types of direction. And you can see that in the dark, they lost the ability to differentiate the two directions. So interestingly, uh, it seems that the uh, cerebellum might also um, coordinate this multiple attractor network um, in particular, uh, when mice have to uh, highly uh, rely on self-motion information, and um, which is an important uh, uh, function for having a unitary representation of direction. Um, okay, so let me conclude this uh, by just summarizing what I have um, presented here. Uh, so first, as a cell play a major role in a self-motion processing. Uh, we have shown current activity between the cerebellum and the hippocampus during navigation and more particularly during the sequence 
today's navigation. So um, uh, with a, a structural maze. And we have also uh, showed that it seems that the cerebellum uh, is able to produce a signal uh, based on a, a self motion sensory processing that stabilize and orchestrate uh, the neural code during uh, navigation and in particular uh, direction and place coding. Uh, and let me. Um, Thanks all um, my team members, so actual team members and previous one, as well as uh, um, our collaborators. So um, Mehdi Falanezad, Julie Lomero, Christelle Rochefort, Alice Paradi, Aurélie Vatillo, <laughs> Arturo torres Serraz, Paulino Bianc, Thomas Watson, Kigloi uh, for the mice work, and King Igloi um, for the uh, human work, as well as um, 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 our collaborators, in particular, uh, Neil Burgess here, and our fundings. I think I stop here. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Laura. Um, people can applaud or virtually applaud. Um, thank you so much. I hope it was not too much of neuroscience. So don't, don't <laughs> please, if you want to complain, do it. <laughs> uh -huh. um, it's it's a lot. <laughs> um, let let me kick it off um, mm -hmm. by by asking a question about terminology. Um, you talk often about place learning and sequence learning. Sometimes about the cognitive loop and the motor loop. Mm -hmm. um, there are also pairs of terms like allocentric and egocentric or allocentric versus inertial navigation. Are all of these distinctions in your mind pretty much synonymous or are there subtle differences? Uh, so you mean be between place-based and allocentric, for example? In other words, are, are all of us who use these various pairs of terms talking about a kind of fundamental contrast about relying on the external world, whether it's beacon learning or the use of boundaries or the use of yeah. distal landmarks sure. or relying on all of the many body cues and then the sequence of body cues and distance direction of how far you've moved. Okay, Is sure. that the fundamental contrast? Yeah, yeah I, I think I made a major contrast between using environmental cues and uh, using self motion cues. Yeah. Um, so when, when, but when I say allocentric, it's true that I don't go into the details um, of the different type of strategy when using uh, these uh, environmental cues. Um, for me, when I say allocentric, is more using the relationship between the between the different uh, cues in the environment. It's not beacon learning. Or it's, uh, and I don't really take into account the geometry here. Okay. Right. And indeed, beacon learning could be something else that could be yeah. more reward based. Yeah. And so there may be further distinctions to definitively, make. Definitively, yeah. But I still think that fundamental contrast is very important. And in a way, it's a pity that we use different sort of labels to discuss it, but that always happens in science. But th then I wanted to go on to a sort of implication in my mind of this for um, something um, that I've been concerned with for a long time and that I remember Sarah Fabricant raising in Lisbon, which is the design of virtual environments. Um, and what we think we're studying in the different virtual environments. So in many of your studies, you show a, a really fundamental distinction between mice and the light, uh, or I forget if it's mice or rats. It's I, mice in my It's case. mice. Uh, mice in the light and mice in the dark. Um, we rarely study humans in the dark, but we sometimes study humans in mazes, sometimes enclosed mazes, sometimes sort of open mazes like the one um, that was uh, shown um, yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. 
that you can see the sky, but there's just yeah. hedges. And there's no distal landmarks. There's occasional punctate, you know, a vase on a pedestal or something. Yeah. Is that equivalent to learning in the dark? I, so that, that's a fundamental question, I think. Um, this is why we did um, one of the study I presented here with the mice uh, learning in the star maze with, with no environmental landmark, uh, but they just have to learn the sequence. And right. I wanted to see if we could find actually the same type of uh, brain networks involved in this sequence learning. And indeed, what we found again is this um, high correlated activity between the hippocampus and the cerebellum, suggesting that um, maybe the cerebellum, uh, so we demonstrated that in the dogs, that the cerebellum is taken into account self motion information. And in this sequence learning, when it's not in the dark, you only have geometry, you don't have environmental um, landmarks. Uh, again, we found the um, similar uh, kind of network, the same part of the cerebellum, the same cross one. So by comparing this um, very um, simple exploration task uh, versus this navigation task, more complex, our idea is to try to understand what is the cerebellum exactly doing. And it seems to us that it is uh, self-motion processing and how then it can influence the rest of the brain in terms of coding and now in terms of uh, navigation also. What are we changing if the cerebellum is not functioning properly? Can we mm -hmm. still be able, uh, so without the cerebellum or with an altered cerebellum, can we still take into account this self-motion information, even if it's not in the dark? That's the main point here, maybe. Yeah. Right, mm. right. Now, in human VR experiments, especially if they're desktop, and you're not moving, yep. but that's the case with the star maze, and you're still finding those kinds of different networks, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we thought, uh, of course, about that, and um, what is interesting is that it's active navigation; it's not passive one, and this right. is a major difference. Uh, so the cerebellum has been shown to uh, be important during active movement, not passive, and you still have optic flow. And for example, it is known that Purkinje cell, which is the main cell of the cellular cortex, they are activated by both vestibular information, but also by optic flow. Uh -huh. uh, so, and you have some proprioception also uh, with uh -huh. the optic. So it seems that even if we lack, uh, or even if there is maybe a mismatch between the vestibular not moving but we have this optic flow and these haptic things. It seems that it's enough in terms of self-motion information to have the right. sense of movement because it is active. And in that right. case, we find the same kind of network. So maybe it's interesting, I was, I was um, um, listening to Sarah Irina Fabrican talks yesterday, trying to uh, imagine what would be a, a, good, um, a, a good way to help navigator. Um, and maybe it's important at least at some point to have the sense of direction of the sense of movement and to still be active when we navigate. Otherwise, for, it can be a problem for some people eventually having a deficit or in some uh, maybe low uh, or environment with a low um, um, landmarks, for example, or poor landmarks. So right. Something right. we can discuss. <laughs> right. No, I, I just to draw this out. This, so it, to my mind, the contrast in uh, the two exploration talks that we heard yesterday, the one out of our group and the one out of UC Irvine, one of the major distinctions was the Silkton environment being, you know, kind of open and there's lots of distal landmarks and lots of visual flow and etc. versus an enclosed maze where even the optic flow along a hedge is like, it's just hedge, 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 like you're not getting a lot of optic flow. And to my mind, that's a really important um, distinction that sometimes we don't take seriously enough. But Sarah has a question about terminology in the chat um, that you could look at, or Sarah, maybe you want to ask yeah. it live. 
Thank you, Laura. I'm just giving you time to read, and it may be completely obvious or like stupid or naive question. It's it's just for my understanding. And thank you very much for your really uh, thought provoking talk, which you know engaged my brain muscles heavily. So to to be able also to to follow and understand. Um, I was just wondering about you had this one, you know, where the maze, and you were saying, well, the sequences of steps uh, encoded or I think you called it place-based uh, yeah. orientation uh, navigation. Is is do I, I make that right analogy in terms of sequence or root sequence, and then or sort of globally trying to establish? Yeah, so a... yep, uh, I would say that um, so root knowledge would be for me the same that sequence learning, mm -hmm. but uh, it has to be active again. Yeah. Because uh, in the literature, you find, for example, ex experiment in which people are passively moved to one um, yeah, um, point of uh, point of uh, um, when they have to choose, and this is mm -hmm. the same in that case. For the survey, so for me, um, place learning is really the ability to know where the landmarks are mm -hmm. and to have a relationship. Uh, to have in mind the relationship yeah. between these different landmarks. So Got you it. have a cognitive map of, so I don't know if it's what you call survey, mm -hmm. but- uh, Yes, yep. okay. I, I would call this in my <laughs> understanding okay. this, and uh, that, that really explains, uh, clarifies, thank you. And just a comment about the, the idea of the active learning. Uh, in one study, um, uh, we modified the design of the, the navigation, uh, the, the map assistance, and just a simple thing like having people stop and type in their own landmark, and you can imagine like, who would ever want to use such a navigation system, but just that actually did not people slow people down in doing the task, navigating from A to B, but it helped them because you were saying, actively proactively engage them while they're navigating and even this kind of disruptive way of stopping is like you have to choose three landmarks on your own and you have to type them in into your system that actually helped people yep. um, in solving the task and finding their way back without the system um, more easily so i think yeah. that was kind you, of a you, nice yeah you said something very important which is uh, this uh, active engagement mm -hmm which I, I think has, has been also important in the uh, learning and memory uh, field. And I think it's the case also in navigation. And maybe this, um, all what I have shown with the CBLM is actually this uh, main point, is active engagement in the navigation, either by reminding the, the landmark where they are or changing the departure point. People have to think about it and, and really to realize something. Um, to, to, to have in mind where are the landmarks, where they have to go, or where they have to plan the sequence. But, but because again, mm -hmm. what we have seen in terms of activities in the first alley. So it means it's before the behavior itself. So people are really thinking of um, the sequence of movement or where they have to go to the place. So this active engagement, yeah, I agree totally with you. I think it's a very important point in the navigation. <laughs> Yeah. Just a tiny little follow question. Do you use, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm so naively asking the mice that you use, are you actually modifying them also like purposefully looking at quote unquote gender or kind of mice background in some uh, ways? Are no, you, I, you, do you mean, did I compare mice? Uh, mice I mean, do mice? people do that? I, I actually have never heard any, any of that. Do people actually purposefully looking at some kind of physiological differences of the mice, of the of your participants, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we, we would it. do gender or, you know, spatial ability. Of course, you, you people do train yeah, the mice. We, and stuff, we, we, we can do that. I mean, we have done that. I mean, okay. individual, individual differences at the level of individual. Yeah, we can score. Oh. We can score, actually. Uh, wow. Ability. <laughs> yeah. And we cool. can have a sort of uh, yeah, um, database. Uh, There's an yeah. old, old tradition of the maize bright and the maize dull rodents. <laughs> um, there is such a thing. You can breed for that. Wow. I'm, uh, I'm amazed. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Other questions? You can just unmute if you like. It's a... <laughs> 
yeah, well, maybe too far, but thank you for the question and thank you, Nora and Sarah. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy I, to chat in the. Uh, in yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think there may be other questions, though, if we give it a moment. Um, or. Um, yeah, Annette. Yeah, so I dare speak up. <clears throat> Um, I have a question about sequence learning. So the further you proceed in the sequence, the more time also elapses. And um, I have read that there are time cells as well. So is there any ambiguity or any overlap between place cells and time cells? Are they the same after all? So um, I'm really wondering what your take on this is. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. So um, what? Uh, so we have done this study um, I have shown only one slide about that with a Scobataglia. And what we observed is actually play cell and time cells can be either two types of cell or the same cell changing actually their activity. We, we found both. And it's true that, um, yeah, some cells are perfectly able to um, be active in a, part, in a particular location. But if mice decide to use uh, to, uh, the sequence rather than the the place uh, memory. In that case, you have a change in the activity of this cell from a place to a, to a more time cell. So in that case, we're more distant cell because time and distance are sometimes not totally uh, dis distinguishable. But yeah, it could be the same or could be different cell. We found those. Yeah. That's really amazing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. I wanted to point out another implication that I drew from your talk for human researchers and the design of learning paradigms, which is that you found very, very distinct sort of neural mechanisms underlying exploration and learned spatial behavior. And for me, the implication of that is that we need to think carefully about whether what we're studying as people go through our environments is initial learning or sort of, I don't know what, you know, firm knowledge, you know, I don't want to use a loaded term like consolidated or anything, um, because they're so distinct in your work. Would you agree? I totally agree that um, the moment you look at it in terms of activity of the brain is really depending on um, um, if the knowledge is consolidated enough or if you are actually uh, learning it. And it's true that what, what puzzled us is that this is the same structure activated. If, if you only look at the structure, structure activated, you find the same. What mm -hmm. is different is which one are co-activated with uh, the others, which changed uh, drastically because, uh, again, it was more like the cortex triatom uh, at the beginning and also dopaminergic, so reward, uh, uh, sort of reward-guided behavior. And at the end, it was totally different because it was this hippocampus, uh, again, involved in the memory of uh, place and memory of sequence. Uh, with the cerebellum dealing with this sensory mm -hmm. information and really mm -hmm. trying to connect with the rest of the brain. So, yeah, mm -hmm. this, yeah. this is interesting. This reorganization is clearly interesting to, yeah. to go yeah. deeper. Yeah. I, I think we need all to think about that a lot. Um, okay, I think we're getting fairly close to um, our virtual break, except that happens in physical reality. <laughs> Are there? Um, okay, I want to thank you so much for uh, a really thought-provoking talk. I only got to ask a few of my many questions, but I think other people are sitting there with questions and um, they can, I'm sure, get in touch with you if they want. It's a you know, long road to understanding each other. So thank yeah, you for yeah. thank you for the being interview. on it. And yeah. Thank you for right. listening to right. the right. talk. Thank you. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Okay. We'll see you all um at half past the hour. Is that right, Jurgis? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See you then. <laughs>